All right. Thanks for sticking with us um, this sunny afternoon here in Rotterdam. Um, thus far, we've been hearing uh, artists taking part in the Art in the Age of Asymmetrical Warfare exhibition, which is on the third floor. Alongside that exhibition, we have uh, Douglas Copeland's Bitrot on the second floor, which also opens uh, right after these talks. Um, Douglas Bitrot, maybe we should be a bit didactic and start with the title and what is what is bitrot? Uh, thank you, Samuel. Bitrot is a term used in the electronic archiving industry, uh, which describes this weird phenomena of not being able to permanently store anything that is digital. And uh, I mean, a very very everyday manifestation of this is you know. Uh, how many people do you know who have iPhones? How many pictures do you have on it? Well, 20,000. How many have you ever printed out? Like, none. And then, you know, Mom, Dad, do you have any pictures of me from the year 2000 to 2015? Like, no. What happened? They all decomposed. And we're uh, across the street, there's a Center for Unstable Media, if I'm getting that correctly. Uh, bit rot is just the half-life of a document that's electronic, and the electrons vanish. I found a box of 56K floppies from the 90s, and I got a reader, and only about half the files were still readable. They're, they're decomposing very quickly. And then upstairs, one of the pieces, it's called the doink. And a doink is technically, it's a sphere made of only one material. In this case, it's tape. And it's inside a plexiglass cube, and like, what if that was a pixel? Like, not not just a bunch of pixels, pixels making one larger pixel, but a pixel. Can a pixel itself rot? Is it like a, an atom? Does it turn into baryons and leptons and muons or whatever? And so I think in that sense, bit rot. Well, it also did the exact same thing in Dutch. That was like a fantastic coincidence. That's very fortunate. Um, could we maybe go from bit rot pixels, accumulation of pixels, to one thing that is key to the whole exhibition, which is the idea of collecting, of um, hoarding even, which is something that you've been thinking and writing about for a while. And for those, you'll see um, in a bit, the exhibition that we put together here is a combination of Doug's own visual, um, visual work and works from his own collection. Um, there are works that you've been living with for the past 10 to 15 years um, that have never been exhibited outside of your house. Um, it must be very strange for you to see them here. Um, but could you maybe tell a bit about um, how you collect or what, what your recent insights have been on collecting as we made this exhibition? Oh boy, I mean, I think uh, everybody collects something. And then sometimes you'll... That's so sweet. <laughs> okay. Um, I think everyone collects something. And, and the, the joke is always with minimalists, especially with curators, uh, at home with the curator and there's nothing in the room. And they're just bullshitting because they collect space. So they're just as bad at hoarding as anyone else. Um, I found with collecting art in particular that if you feel the need to acquire something, uh, why not just follow that impulse a little bit and see what happens? And, and what I found with art is that things that were really percolating in my subconscious came to the, the forefront very quickly. Uh, I come from Vancouver, Canada. I have this gun nut family. So I, and my dad was in the Canadian Air Force, so I was always surrounded by pictures of jets or rifles on the wall. And my brother is a taxidermist, so I was always surrounded by the insides and outsides of dead things everywhere. And so I grew up, became an adult, and got my own place. And, you know, it's the complete opposite of everything I grew up with. Like, there I've escaped my family's hillbilly curse. And my friend says, that's no such thing. Look over there. There's a, a print, F-111, by James Rosenquist. Like, the fighter jet. What does your dad do? OK. What's that over there? Why, it's a military figure. Why, what's that? And it turns out that everything I collected was about death or destruction in some form. And the moment I found out that, it was great, because I got rid of everything that wasn't about that. And then, if you look at the rooms, various uh, isms or, uh, of, 
aggregation, hoarding, or collecting uh, emerge. Uh, there's one end where it, if it were not for this show, I would not have realized that I am really into uh, staged photography, which is probably sort of has to do with coming from Vancouver, but also uh, stage photography that documents the collapse of institutions or the instability of institutions. Uh, you go into a room at the back. Uh, there's all these images which are sort of just coming in or out of focus, like pointillism or uh, digital images that are fragmenting. Uh, some of them, it's like a, a photograph of people at a Grateful Dead concert, but their heads are becoming pixels. And what's that going on? What's that all about? And I, and I realized there was this wonderful show at the Moderno Musée in Stockholm three or four years ago. It was Turner, uh, Twombly, and Monet. And it looked at the last 10 years of their lives, and it says, well, what goes on in the work of someone who knows that they're you know, you know, near the end of the road? and that there are actual formal tendencies that might be sort of inbuilt into us as a species. Uh, uh, a tendency to clear out the picture plane, uh, uh, a sense of almost looking for the light. It's like, oh. And I think that a lot of the images in that room are about death or thinking of death on some level, sort of making themselves manifest. The, the, the weirdest one, and I'll, I'll stop after this, um, about 2005, I began collecting images of uh, human bodies up in the air, but not jumping, just human bodies in some sort of contorted form up uh, through for whatever reason. Okay, Doug, there's something going on here. Uh, what's this all about? And then it was one of the anniversaries of 9-11, and of course, it's everyone's gorging on YouTube and looking at the same images over and over. It's like, oh, okay, I've been, I, I've been thinking of jumpers. And then, well, wh what's that all about? And then the soldier figure you see up in one of the rooms up there, that was in my very first show ever, which was in on Spring Street in New York. It opened September 9th, 2001. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, and the whole show was covered with 9-11 dust for six months or what have you. And there's some aspect, that experience sort of tethers me to the time and place there. And so I was with William Gibson, who's a, a Vancouver friend and neighbor, and well, let's look at 9-11 then, and what you see, and what you look at down, what you look down at the street, you see people who look kind of like people from right now, except the only thing is missing is they're not doing this, they're not recording what's going on. And digital imagery, yet again, it seems to define our era. And well, what, what if you made an image of 9-11 that did a few things? Like you could other, especially jumpers, which are the most potent image, like if you choose not to see it, you can choose not to see it, but well, you know, dots are round, pixels are square, and when you put them together on an, a smartphone, they basically kind of, your camera freaks out, and what appears to be just a very simple image of dots or an op-art image very quickly resolves into a UPI photo or a Reuters photo of one of the jumpers, and like, and people think, oh, that's bullshit. And in Vancouver and Toronto, they like, it, you know, <gasps> and then, then you realize that we have these images. They're, they're inside all of our reptile brainstem at this point. They're not even out here. They're way back there now. And it's still too soon. It's probably always going to be too soon. And, but we never really talk about it, or we do, it's only briefly, and then we change the subject. So, uh, I'm a child of pop. I love pop. I love slick surfaces. I like bright colors. But I also kind of like it when there's like some toxic candy inside the pink wrapper. There's something sort of poisonous about it. That's a long answer to a short question. I'll shut up. Okay. okay. Um, alongside the exhibition, we, we also made a book um, also named Bitrot. In, in that book, um, there is a text by you called an app called You. And I remember when you sent it to me and I read it and I thought, you di you've d you're describing an app that is a sort of mindscaping tool or a mind mapping tool, which is precisely what we set out to do with this exhibition is map out your mind or, or unfold um, 
in a visual way all the all the topics that you've been dealing with in in the past couple of years. And before um, I forgot which one of, of our previous speakers it was, someone said that we are using uh, the internet to understand also our own mind. And I think this is this is an interesting point. Um, to, to start discussing something that you've been looking at recently, also in light of your residency at the Google Cultural Institute, is algorithmic technologies. Is our mind functioning like an algorithm, or is an algorithm imitating the way our minds have always been working? Well, an app called You. It, 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 you would actually began as possible real project to do with Google. Like, what if you gave them access to your Gmail, your, G, uh, your Google search history, Google Maps, uh, all the metadata out there that you create in the course of a day. And then you also allowed it to tap into your Facebook feeds or whatever feed you have going. And then if you have a device on you, your geographical data, and then if you want, you can have some sort of GoPro or a, an advanced uh, optical scanning thing that sees everything in the course of a day and then at the end of the day you sit down and it spits back a version of your day back to you except it's a lateral view maybe it's um, the street that you were on driving but it continues and then suddenly uh, you hear Siri or someone reading out a letter that you wrote and then so to someone on email and then it clicks into like, oh, someone you knew from high school is getting married. And, and, and then depending if you turn up the sex, if you turn up the music, if you turn up or down into these factors, you actually end up with a simulation of your day. And then, well, why not make it a day? Why not just make it your year or your 10 year span or your life or my very first show ever, which was in, on Spring Street in New York. It opened September 9th, 2001. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, and the whole show was covered with 9-11 dust for six months or what have you. And there's some aspect, that experience sort of tethers me to the time and place there. And so I was with William Gibson, who's a, a Vancouver friend and neighbor, and, well, let's look at 9-11 then, and what do you see? And what you look at down, what you look down at the street, you see people who look kind of like people from right now, except the only thing is missing is they're not doing this. They're not recording what's going on. And digital imagery, yet again, it seems to define our era. And well, what, what if you made an image of 9-11 that did a few things? Like you could other, especially jumpers, which are the most potent image. Like if you choose not to see it, you can choose not to see it. but well, you know, dots are round, pixels are square, and when you put them together on an, an, a smartphone, they basically kind of, your camera freaks out, and you, what appears to be just a very simple image of dots or an opart image very quickly resolves into a UPI photo or a Reuters photo of one of the jumpers, and like, and people think, oh, that's bullshit. And then in Vancouver and Toronto, they like, it, you know, <gasps> and then, then you realize that we have these images. They're, they're inside all of our reptile brainstem at this point. They're not even out here. They're way back there now. And it's still too soon. It's probably always going to be too soon. And But we never really talk about it. Or if we do, it's only briefly. And then we change the subject. So uh, I'm a child of pop. I love pop. I love slick surfaces. I like bright colors. But I also kind of like it when there's like some toxic candy inside the pink wrapper. There's something sort of poisonous about it. That's a long answer to a short question. I'll shut up. Okay. Um, alongside the exhibition, we, we also made a book um, also named Bitrot. In, in that book, um, there is a text by you called an app called You. And I remember when you sent it to me and I read it and I thought, you d you've d you're describing an app that is a sort of mindscaping tool or a mind mapping tool, which is precisely what we set out to do with this exhibition, is map out your mind or, or unfold um, in a visual way all the, all the topics that you've been dealing with in, in the past couple of years. And before, um, I forgot which one of, of our previous speakers it was, someone said that we are using uh, the internet to understand also our own mind. And I think this is, this is an interesting point um, 
to, to, to start discussing something that you've been looking at recently, also in light of your residency at the Google Cultural Institute, is algorithmic technologies. Is our mind functioning like an algorithm, or is an algorithm imitating the way our minds have always been working? Well, an app called You, it, it, it you would actually began as a possible real project to do with Google. Like what if you gave them access to your Gmail, your, G, uh, your Google search history, Google Maps, uh, all the metadata out there that you create in the course of a day. And then you also allowed it to tap into your Facebook feeds or whatever feed you have going. And then if you have a device on you, your geographical data, and then if you want, you can have some sort of GoPro or a, an advanced uh, optical scanning thing that sees everything in the course of a day. And then at the end of the day, you sit down and it spits back a version of your day back to you except it's a lateral view. Maybe it's um, the street that you were on driving, but it continues, and then suddenly uh, you hear Siri or someone reading out a letter that you wrote, and then so to someone on email, and then it clicks into, like, oh, someone you knew from high school is getting married, and, and, and then depending if you turn up the sex, if you turn up the music, if you turn up or down, into these factors, you actually end up with a simulation of your day. And then, well, why not make it a day? Why not just make it your year or your 10 year span or your life or the last 10 minutes? And, and then we're in this unusual situation now where smart algorithms properly collated, collated and assembled can actually feed back to you an approximation of your life. And then human beings are actually in a lot of ways very, very simple. You know, Amazon can tell if you're gay within three book purchases or something. It's like insane <laughs> how much they can tell from just a few simple things. And uh, and this data is only going to grow. Doesn't that scare you? Well, the other, the other thing about all this data coming back to haunt you is that it's it's not as if there's a government out there that's manipulating with you, manipulating you with it. It's just you know having a really good waffle knit Henley from Abercrombie and Fitch be recognized, be re recommended for you like everywhere you go in your life. Like, oh, oh I see you're wearing that fabric. Well, it's just this endless sort of peck, peck to death by ducks capitalism that we have coming out of it. And sort of the, the horror is the, the boredom of it more than it is the abuse. Uh, you know, th I, it's interesting to watch Google in Europe the people here have a much more different relationship to it than they do in North America. And, yeah, well, in Google's Google. I mean, you can go to Bing or Yahoo if you want. There's no law saying you do or don't have to go there. Um, but it's a few things. Um, the right to be forgotten, which I think is like really wonderful. And it can only come out of Europe. That the, the Americans would never in a million years come out with like the right to be forgotten. Um, The other issue is, well, in 1983, in North America, the AT&T, it was an antitrust suit, it was too big, so they chopped it up into seven, they called them the baby bells, which in the end actually became huge in themselves. But, well, could you chop up Google and make a national Google for like Holland, France, Denmark, England? You can't really do it, because you can't chop up a search engine, you can't give pornography to one country, gaming to another country, what have you. And the best time to fix this situation was 20 years ago, and the only country that got it right was China. But then, so China's got its own search engine, its own Facebook, but the government runs it, so it's kind of useless and untrustworthy. And so, well, do you want the Dutch government to develop its own Dutch search engine? Well, that's the government, which is scarier than Google, in a way. And so you're in this very weird situation. We have this technology that because of its intrinsic structure, you can't chop it off without killing it. And, uh, and we're in terra incognita. There's nothing like this in the history of human civilization. And on top of it, we are now inside the future. The future was always 2000, then it was uh, 10 years in the future, then the future was oh, maybe two years from now, and now we had this scope creep, and boom, we, we've actually, the horizon is 
where you're actually standing and we're inside the future now, 24 hours a day, and it's spooky and it's kind of creeping us out. We know we're trapped. Is this as good as it gets? Well, you're never, you're only ever going to have as much internet freedom uh, as you're ever going to get right now. From now for the rest of history, rights and freedoms are going to be chipped away from it. So I think it's important to remember that. Now I remember, I, mean, I grew up in the 70s, and, and one of the memories from the 70s is, is these Charlton Heston movies. He's this actor who died recently. And it, he was an Omega Man, like the last guy on Earth. And Planet of the Apes, where, you know, living in essentially the aftermath of a nuclear war, uh, Soylent Green, where if you took a shower in the year 1999, it was like the most exotic and wonderful thing you could do. And you grew up with these very, very dark, harsh versions of the future, uh, as well as all the Cold War political uh, debris. And here we are in 2015, and it's actually kind of not bad. You know, there are problems happening for sure, but it's not Soylent Green. It's not that dreadful future. I mean, there's strange things happening. Meeting Andy Warhol in heaven and saying, hey, you made this painting about us. Um, and Doug will be signing copies of Bitrot right after this talk. Um, you can get the book downstairs and take it back up and we will sign it here. Um, I love the vit de vit. <laughs> I, I never pronounce it correctly. Um, I love Daphne, I love Samuel. Everyone here, they've been terrific to work with. Uh, the best prep staff I've ever worked with at any museum. It's been an absolute delight, and um, so thank you. Um, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Thank you.